Um, we are. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, uh, I wanted to acknowledge the land that we are living on and meeting from and speaking on um, is the unceded and stolen territory of the Duwamish, the Coast Salish, and Spokane peoples. Um, and if you are on any other land, please go ahead and throw that in the chat. I think we've already had a couple people um, contributing there as well. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, just how exceptionally fortunate we are to hear from each of these speakers today. Um, I'll have them introduce themselves in just a little bit here, but I wanted to say that I just really appreciate uh, that they took the time out of their very busy schedules to share with us um, their knowledge and experience about these issues and, and, and about how this um, plays out in a healthcare setting. Um, so today I, I welcome Dr. Tenefos, um, Nicole Sampson, Dr. Bravel, um, and, and I want them to each introduce who they are and how they got involved in their line of work. And then we're gonna go through this presentation, um, hear a little bit more about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted these issues um, and how people experiencing homelessness navigate these, uh, 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 navigate their menstrual health. Um, and so with that, I would love to start uh, just with uh, an introduction from uh, Dr. Tenefos. Well, thanks for having us. I am Dr. Tenafas. I'm a doctor of nursing practice. I'm duly certified in women's health and also primary care. And I spent my practice in women's health um, now in Spokane at Planned Parenthood. Um, so definitely addressing each of these issues every day. And I'm Nicole Tenafson. I'm a certified nurse midwife. Um, advanced practice registered nurse. I have a master's degree. I started my uh, advanced practice nursing career in 2015 um, in the military, actually. Um, I was uh, catching babies then and did that for about five years and loved it. But then when I retired in 2019, just wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, I really love Planned Parenthood's um, you know, uh, mission. And uh, so I applied here love working here, love, and love the people. Um, it's been really great. And it's been a little bit different than catching babies. It's a lot, you know, a lot of education and a lot of um, infection checks and, and uh, birth control. So lots of really cool stuff. And I love what I do. And yeah, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> I'll go ahead and just quickly introduce myself as well. Uh, my name is Rachel. I am um, currently a medical resident, um, did my intern year in OBGYN at the University of California, Irvine, and I'll be continuing, um, actually moving to Boston Medical Center um, to continue training there. Um, I am very passionate about health equity as it pertains specifically to OBGYN care, because that's my specialty, of course, but also because of the vast disparities that we continue to see that are not just on racial lines, which I think are the most jarring, but also along other lines, whether that be class lines, regional, um, et cetera. And one of my goals as a physician is to provide for my patients in the most equitable manner possible. Um, and when we have issues that are preventing people from really maintaining health and wellness, and we kind of drill into it and realize it's because of social determinants of health, we do a disservice if we don't necessarily think about what we can do to improve that in order to do our jobs better. Um, I'm really glad that I'm here with a, um, a doctor of nurse practice as well as a certified nurse midwife because we all are doing the same types of things in the same and similar spaces. Um, and so being able to bring our voices together and, and leverage our unique um, perspectives really is what makes a difference. Um, I run an Instagram page called the Black OBGYN Project, which um, is kind of my way of showing and sharing awareness, um, especially when it comes to uh, health equity in OBGYN spaces and um, lenses of anti-racism in an evidence-based manner. Uh, so that's kind of what has gotten me um, here today. And I, I work with Brahm and kind of consider him one of my mentees. And so I, I am very humbled to have been invited here to talk a little bit more about period equity and how come that's an important topic and conversation that we should all be having. I appreciate you being here too, Dr. Bergal. It's yeah. wonderful to be alongside you. And uh, as we present, if you want to chime in at any point in time. I know you were able to look through the PowerPoint. Please do. Um, Nicole and I kind of put this together and 
and it just barely scratches the surface, but kind of hitting all the high points. So please feel free to jump in. And with that, we will get started with the PowerPoint. And I'll start off here. Okay. All right, so these are our objectives for this presentation. Um, um, very simple, you know, understanding the basic science of the menstrual cycle. We're not going to get into that in great detail because that's, I don't think that's exactly why we're here, but just to really understand it is important um, as a basis. Um, to have a better understanding of menstrual inequities, um, especially in the United States, um, and learn how to be your own best advocate regarding your health administration. Um, oftentimes, I think it's, it's difficult to know what to say to your doctor, know when to go to the doctor. Um, you know, that, that can be a very difficult thing to, to figure out a lot of times. And so we, we want to shed some light on that. Um, and then also know where to go to find reliable information regarding your health. This is a huge problem, right? Not finding information isn't a problem, but finding reliable information is. Um, and so we're just going to give you a few, a few areas that you could look into. Okay. And we put this little four minute video in here um, because I think it explains the menstrual, menstrual cycle very well um, in a brief setting and a little more interesting than me just talking. So um, I'm going to play this and then um, afterwards, again, I'm not going to get into like great detail of, of the pathophys of this, but if anybody has any questions afterwards, please, please let us know. This might seem hard to believe, but right now, 300 million women across the planet are experiencing the same thing, a period. The monthly menstrual cycle that leads to the period is a reality most women on Earth will go through in their lives. But why is this cycle so universal? And what makes it a cycle in the first place? Periods last anywhere between two and seven days, arising once within a 28-day rotation. That whole system occurs on repeat, happening approximately 450 times during a woman's life. Behind the scenes are a series of hormonal controls that fine tune the body's internal workings to make menstruation start or stop during those 28 days. This inner machinery includes two ovaries stocked with thousands of tiny sacs called follicles that each contain one oocyte, an unfertilized egg cell. At puberty, ovaries hold over 400,000 egg cells, but release only one each month, which results in pregnancy or a period. Here's how the cycle unfolds. Each month beginning around puberty, the hormone-producing pituitary gland in the brain starts releasing two substances into the blood, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. When they reach the ovaries, they encourage the internal egg cells to grow and mature. The follicles respond by pumping out estrogen. The egg cells grow and estrogen levels peak, inhibiting the production of FSH and telling the pituitary to pump out more LH. That causes only the most mature egg cell from one of the ovaries to burst out of the follicle and through the ovary wall. This is called ovulation and it usually happens 10 to 16 days before the start of a period. The tiny oocyte moves along the fallopian tube. A pregnancy can only occur if the egg is fertilized by a sperm cell within the next 24 hours. Otherwise, the egg's escapade ends and the window for pregnancy closes for that month. Meanwhile, the now empty follicle begins to release progesterone, another hormone that tells the womb's lining to plump up with blood and nutrients in preparation for a fertilized egg that may embed there and grow. If it doesn't embed, a few days later, the body's progesterone and estrogen levels plummet, meaning the womb stops padding out and starts to degenerate, eventually falling away. Blood and tissue leave the body, forming the period. The womb can take up to a week to clear out its unused contents, after which the cycle begins anew. Soon afterwards, the ovaries begin to secrete estrogen again and the womb lining thickens, getting ready to accommodate a fertilized egg or be shed. Hormones continually control these activities by circulating in ideal amounts delivered at just the right time. 
the cycle keeps on turning, transforming each day and each week into a milestone along its course towards pregnancy or a period. Although this cycle appears to move by clockwork, there's room for variation. Women and their bodies are unique after all. Menstrual cycles occur at different times in the month, ovulation comes at various points in the cycle, and some periods last longer than others. Menstruation even begins and ends at different times in life for different women, too. In other words, variations between periods are normal. Appreciating these differences and learning about this monthly process can empower women, giving them the tools to understand and take charge of their own bodies. That way, they're able to factor this small cycle into a much larger cycle of life. So I think, you know, the, the menstrual cycle, it's fascinating, like it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and it can tell you so much, right? Um, and uh, it's, I don't think it's super common knowledge um, for most young women to know um, really what's going on there. And, and uh, it's just, it's just a cool thing. Um, so now that you have just a very kind of basic understanding of what goes on. We're gonna to talk to you a little bit about the differences in the menstrual cycle, which, uh, you know, of course there are many, and, you know, when to seek out care, when to ask for help, um, because everybody's so different. So it's hard to tell, right? So I'll take, yeah, I'll, I'll go over this part. So I kind of put together, when should you go to the, men or when should you, go to the doctor. If you are at the doctor, when do you talk about the menstrual cycle? Um, so I kind of broke this down into kind of different categories when we talk about like bleeding, we talk about pain, um, other symptoms. So it can be normal to have, you know, mild cramping with your menstrual cycle. Some people get moderate to severe that only lasts for 24, 48 hours. Um, having, you know, what, how much bleeding is too much bleeding? What's not enough bleeding? Um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, when are, you know, all those things, are they normal or when should you talk to someone? So that's really what I tried to highlight here. Um, so the first thing is pain, right? So the technical term for pain is dysmenorrhea. So if you're talking, if your doctor says, oh, okay, I'm going to diagnose you with dysmenorrhea, it, it sounds foreign. Okay. What are they talking about? They're talking about pain. There's two types. We call it primary and secondary, and it's really about when does the pain occur? So not overly important. Um, I think the biggest thing when we talk about pain with your menstrual cycle, if over the counter and said, so ibuprofen, Advil, they aren't helping the menstrual cycle, or if your pain is interfering with your daily activities or that school work, not able to do what you need to do for your family, um, working out self-care, it's important. Um, to talk to your doctor about that. Um, or if your pain is happening at other times in the menstrual cycle, um, not just before your period, and then it's alleviated, you know, 24, 48 hours into your menstrual cycle. And that's what I would say for, if we're gonna talk about common, we just saw, saw that, you know, the menstrual cycle is not the same for everyone. I, I would say there's over, this overarching concept on what's normal. Um, so really it's, when we talk about pain, if it's occurring other times and it's not alleviated when the cycle starts, ibuprofen, Tylenol, is it helping and it's in interfering, that's an important time to go ahead and start talking to your doctor about that. Um, so this kind of hits on bleeding. So what's, what, what's normal? How much is, what's too long? What's too short? Um, so heavy bleeding, about one in five women are affected by this. Um, so really we say, you know, a normal menstrual period is anywhere from typically, you know, three to seven days, can be eight, two to eight, depending on who you talk to, what provider you go to. But really the biggest thing here is if your period is lasting longer than eight days, that's a, that's a long time, you're bleeding too much. Um, a, a big thing to do is talk, we talk about when we talk to our patients, um, okay, how much are you bleeding? Are you using pads? Are you using tampons? Are you using a menstrual cup? So we wanna know what are you using? How much are you using of that? Or how often are you having to change it? So we say, if you're bleeding through one or more pads or tampons, you know, every hour, you're probably bleeding too much. If you're getting 
dizzy, lightheaded, weak, tired, having chest pain. We worry about anemia. So that's really the biggest thing is what everything comes down to when we talk about bleeding. If you're bleeding too much, we worry that that puts you at risk. Are you losing too much blood? Number one, we worry about anemia. Are you, you know, having to have an iron infusion, something like that, or hemorrhaging? That's, that's too much blood. Um, so in addition to if you're bleeding more than, you know, or longer than eight days, or if you're going through more than a powder tampon every hour, um, another thing to do would look for are blood clots. So, you know, we say quarter size blood clots, pretty normal, anything, you know, around that. So I ask my patients, are they, the, are they dime sized? Are they nickel sized? Are they quarter? Are they golf ball? Are they softball? Um, so anything bigger than a quarter, something you should be mentioning. I mean, you know, some providers, if you go in for your annual review, whether it's primary care or GYN, um, you know, I like to ask about their menstrual cycle. So if your provider's not asking you that and you're experiencing this, I think it's certainly, you know, speak up and say, you know, um, I've been using pads or tampons or menstrual, and I'm having to change it pretty often or I'm bleeding super long or bleeding, um, you know, having clots that are bigger than quarters, certainly something to speak up about. So talking about unusual abnormal bleeding. So this is bleeding that's in addition to your typical menstrual bleeding. So anything that's happening that's not your period. So bleeding after sex. If you're bleeding after sex, that's something important to talk to your doctor about. Um, spotting or bleeding that's not during the time of your normal menstrual cycle. So if you ended your cycle two weeks later, you're now spotting, it resolves and you go on to have your cycle, definitely something to talk about. Um, and really it just comes down to any bleeding that's heavier or lasting longer or, or not occurring on what is a normal menstrual cycle for you, certainly should talk to your doctor about. We talk about periods. Is my period regular? So not only like how much, you know, is my cramping normal? Are my symptoms I'm having normal? Am I bleeding too much? I think it's important to say like, what is a normal cycle? Everybody's a little bit different. I think depending on what resource you look at, what provider you talk to, what kind of what their specialty, are they reproductive endocrinologist? Are they GYN? Are they surgical non? I think you get a normal cycle anywhere from about 21 to 50 days. Here, we personally use a menstrual cycle as normal anywhere from every 22 to 40 days. Um, and I think really what this boils down to is that, okay, if you're 48 days, you're probably fine. If that's consistent every month for you, it's if you're going, if you're normally having a 32 day cycle, you know, you're having that every month and now all of a sudden, you're having like 80 days in between bleeding, that's, that's when it's time to say, okay, now I'm having an irregular period. So really whether you're 21 days, you're 32 days, you're 40 days, whatever is normal for you is what should be happening every single month. Um, so I think we can get hung up on, okay, well, it's not 28 days, so it's not normal. No, that's just like um, a, a guesstimate, you know, or something, a starting point that we use. Um, how to determine what your cycle is for you. And so, you look at day one of your menstrual cycle to day one of your next menstrual cycle, and then you average that out over the months. And so really, I think a great you know, place to start for this, if you want to use a calendar, that's perfectly fine to mark it on a calendar. I'm kind of old school. I like to do that. Otherwise, getting an app on your phone is certainly something which will come up again later in the talk. Certainly something to do to track your periods. Um, we'll give a PSA for that the best thing that you can do for yourself is track your menstrual cycle, whether that's on a calendar or in your phone. Um, you know, and we kind of talked about, this just kind of hit some highlights of, you know, your period doesn't care about uh, the 17th of the month every month, if that's what you come on. It's really, you know, it doesn't care what day, it doesn't care if it's Sunday, if it's, Tuesday, if it's Sunday last month, if it's Tuesday this month, that's okay. It doesn't care, you know, if it's the beginning of the month and now it's the end of the month, we're really just looking at the length of days to be consistent from month to month. Um, and then, you know, the very last point that I'm hitting here, which I kind of already, I'm just gonna reiterate to say that if your periods vary by more than 20 days. So an example of that is every month, you know, each month you're around 25 to 26 days. And you've had that for the last two years. So if all of a sudden now, you know, they're 60 days apart, definitely something to start sharing to say, you know, um, hey, this is happening. And we'll also put a plug for this in later. If it happens once, probably not a big deal. It's when it's consistently happening. So when we talk about you passed a clot one time that was the size of a lemon, but it's never happened again. If it happened just one time, probably okay. 
Um, but if our pain is worsening or it's staying persistent, um, you know, that irregular bleeding, you're, it's lasting longer, you're continually getting larger clots with each menstrual cycle, or now they're really irregular, definitely time to start saying something if, if it's staying pretty consistent. Um, so it brings us to talking about missed periods. So when is when do we talk about a missed period? So the technical term for that is amenorrhea. So if you see that, or a doctor kind of starts speaking those terms, you have to forget a little bit. Sometimes I have to take myself back and kind of rephrase things no matter what I'm talking about. Um, so if you're missing your period, this happens in about three to four percent of women. Um, and this is really when you're going, you know, if you miss one period, probably not a big deal. Amenorrhea, if you go for longer than really three months without a menstrual cycle is what we start to look at. If you're not pregnant and you're not breastfeeding, you shouldn't be going longer than three months without a menstrual cycle. And really the biggest thing about that is when you're not on hormones, you're not pregnant and um, you're not breastfeeding, we worry about, you know, kind of protecting the uterus, um, which is, you know, we saw that it builds this lining every month. It's supposed to shed that lining when you're not pregnant. We're not shedding that lining that builds up. And so we kind of worry about that or, you know, are you correctly building one? So longer than three months, time to talk about it. Um, I think most of us here are, you know, we're not postmenopausal or perimenopausal and we've already likely started our periods, but really if you have friends, you know, family, colleagues, um, if they haven't, you know, individuals who haven't started a period by age 15, um, or you haven't started your period once you've already started to have like breast bud development, um, something to start talking to the doctor about. And lastly, it's going to end on migraine. So we talked, you know, we've talked about pain with the menstrual cycle. We've talked about how often should you get your menstrual cycle? How much should you bleed? What's normal with that? Um, and if you don't bleed, when to say something? And so really the biggest thing, the other thing that I'm going to end on is kind of headaches with your menstrual cycle. Um, about four out of 10 women, so 40% are getting a migraine in their lifetime. And about half of those women are getting migraines that happen around their period. So yes, headaches can be normal, um, but it's when those headaches aren't alleviated by those over-the-counter type NSAID things. If you're getting changes to your headaches, you know, side effects for medicine. Um, the biggest plug for us when we talk about migraines in the menstrual cycle is migraines with aura. And so those are neurological um, visual disturbances. So, you know, flashing lights, blurry vision, um, numbness, weakness, motor deficit, speech deficit. If you're getting those headaches and you are already on um, hormonal birth control, it's something to talk to your doctor about. I feel like we, you know, kind of say, hey, do you have migraines with aura? I would say most people don't know what migraines with aura means. And so if we're just asking and you've never been told that, you're going to say no. Um, so if you're having headaches, I think it's important to say, you know, I do have headaches. Can we talk a little bit of, of more about what my headaches are like? Um, so that really that can be explored and we can get you on the right type of birth control if you're on that. A lot of time patients who have migraines with no visual disturbances, no or birth control is absolutely safe, specifically estrogen containing birth control. And a lot of times that will even alleviate um, migraines that occur with the menstrual cycle. So enrolling with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Nicole um, and kind of hit some more of those highlights and talk about, you know, we talked about when to talk to the doctor. Now, you know, what we wish, um, or let's highlight what we want patients to know. So we'll have Nicole talk about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, these are just some things that, you know, we, and, and we say we wish you knew before you came in, not because we're bothered by answering these questions, but, you know, these are like stuff that we want to get the word out like we want you to be more empowered and these are some, just some of the things that we um, you know want want women to know about about their bodies especially um, uh, their menstrual cycles so um, hormonal birth control is sometimes prescribed for women uh, women's health concerns other than preventing pregnancy um, so this is you know we have I have a lot of very young patients that come in that have started their menstrual cycles or are not sexually active and they come in, you know, for birth control to control their bleeding. A lot of times um, certain birth control pills or certain methods that really do a good job at helping with really heavy periods or painful periods. Um, and it has nothing to do with the, the person's uh, 
sexual activity. Um, and, you know, that doesn't bother us at all, but I know it can be, uh, can be an issue with friends and family. And so um, we wish, you know, just this would be an overall thing that people realize. And hopefully there's not any shaming going on, and, but it does happen, yeah. Um, we talked about if it happens just once, you probably don't need to be seen for it. So that's kind of what we've touched on before. You know, if you miss one period, probably okay. Um, if you're not pregnant or breastfeeding, um, we definitely want to find out if you're pregnant if you miss the period. But if it just happens one time, that could be um, very normal. It's common. Um, stress is a huge factor in in our periods and like the regularity of them. Um, and it doesn't mean like you have to be stressed out and like upset. That can certainly do it. But I mean, it could be just any kind of big life change, you know, a move, um, graduating it could be very, you know, positive experiences in life, but it's still a stressor. And um, our bodies are really sensitive to that. And so um, sometimes just, just a, even a good stressor can cause an irregularity in your period. Um, tracking your cycle and symptoms every month puts you in control, right? So this, um, it, it's hard for some of us to track things for sure. Um, there's so many great apps out there now. Um, one that I really like, uh, and it's uh, sponsored by Planned Parenthood, it's called Spot On, um, just how it sounds, Spot On. And you are able to track your cycles. You can put in what birth control you're on if you are, and it'll remind you when to take your, you know, if you have to change out pills or change, or change out like vaginal rings, like it'll tell you when, uh, kind of helps you with that and tells you when your fertile windows are. So that's, it's really cool. Um, and that really puts you in control of your own body, right? It, it can help you prevent pregnancy. It can help you plan a pregnancy when that's time. Um, and it can help you identify maybe things that are going wrong um, that you may not have noticed if you haven't been tracking. Um, you know, oftentimes somebody and it's like, I don't know when my last menstrual period was. And so we have no idea, um, you know, how, how far along they are if they're pregnant or, um, you know, just that, that really helps a lot when you come in and knowing those things because that helps us kind of help, help you in diagnosing. If you have a uterus, you can become pregnant. And yes, this is very general, but it's true. So it, um, there are many, many factors that can affect you know, the ability to get pregnant. But basically, um, if you have a uterus, you are at risk for getting pregnant. Um, trust me, we've had, <laughs> I mean, you know, one of the ones I'll never forget, like a, a woman with a tubal ligation, which is like, you know, the sterilization procedure. and the husband that had a vasectomy and you know she's over 40 can't even pregnant if you have a uterus it's a you have a possibility of becoming pregnant and i mentioned this you know just to be very aware of that but i feel it's very common i think for young women who have never been pregnant to have a fear that they can't get pregnant um that's a pretty normal uh feeling um and a normal concern um but if, especially if you're having normal, regular menstrual cycles, you can definitely get pregnant. You know, very likely if you're having regular menstrual cycles every month, you're ovulating every month. Um, but even if you're not having normal cycles every month, you're probably still ovulating occasionally and it's just harder to track that. Um, we ovulate in a 28 day cycle, we ovulate around day 14. So it's always mid in, right in the middle of that cycle. So this is just a, a point that I wish everybody understood. If you have a uterus, you can become pregnant um, if you're having sex, right? So uh, uh, next one, you do not just have to deal with the pain. So um, periods, again, they can be painful, um, but it should never be severe. You know, you should not be missing work or school um, because of the pain. Um, you should not, you know, have to take any more than just ibuprofen, you know, to, if it's severe pain that's not controlled with just normal ibuprofen, Tylenol, and like a heating pad, then there might be something going on that we need to check out and can, and can help, okay? Um, there are many different, you know, reasons for that, so I don't want to get into great detail about what they are, but, um, you know, 
there could be fibroids, there could be endometriosis, there could be a lot of things. So just, um, just let us know, you know, you do not have to deal with that pain, okay? Um, it is your choice. Women should use whatever uh, they feel comfortable for with menstrual hygiene. So there are lots of different options now. Tampons and pads have been around forever. Um, they're not the greatest for some people. Some people love them. There's now the new cups, uh, menstrual cups, which you know I think are really awesome um, for a lot of people, but not everybody. Menstrual discs, which are a little bit different than the cups. So there's lots of different things out there now, thankfully. Um, they even have those the period underwear now, which are really cool. So lots of different options, um, you know, and uh, if you have questions about any of them, we're welcome to answer those questions for you. Um, I already talked about this a little bit, how stress can affect your cycle. Um, so I won't go into that again. Uh, everybody's bodies, including their periods are different. So it's hard to really compare yourself to your mom or your sister or your friend um, because everybody is different, okay? So, you know, look at yourself individually and, and we can figure out what's going on. Um, don't skip your gynecological appointment because you're on your period. So there are certain things that, we uh, like a pap smear that we would prefer there not be heavy bleeding because that can kind of obscure the results of the pap smear. But for the most part, if you're on your period, that is totally fine. Um, and uh, we don't mind whatsoever. It may be uncomfortable for the patient and we totally understand that. So, you know, that is your choice as well, but you do not have to cancel your appointment if you're on your period. <laughs> this one I just put in kind of for fun. Hair does not offend us. I don't know how many times I've done a pelvic exam and the patient says, I'm so sorry, I haven't shaved. And I don't, you know, talk about their legs, the pubic hair. We cannot care less if you've shaved your legs or anything else. Trust us, it does not bother us. Um, there, you know, women do not actually have to shave. It's a, it's a very... <laughs> not controversial topic. topic, but don't worry about us. We can handle it, anything, okay? Um, little nicks from shaving make can make your skin vulnerable to certain infections. Um, so when you know, we shave, especially with a razor, that makes little tiny microscopic little um, tears and uh, in the skin. And you can not only get uh, folliculitis, which is an inflammation of the hair follicle where some bacteria gets into the hair follicle and causes um, sometimes painful bumps that can be mistaken for sexually transmitted infections. But if you do have anything like um, uh, genital warts or like HPV warts, for instance, like shaving around that area, it's like it's like planting the whole field of HPV warts. So um, there are some risks to to using a razor for shaving as well. So that's just another plug for if you don't want to shave, you don't have to. It's okay. Um, <laughs> it is truly safe to skip periods if you're taking a hormonal contraceptive that stops them. In fact, keeping the uterine lining thin is protective and that it reduces the risk of uterine cancer and ovarian cancer. So um, there is some, you know, Demetria touched on like if you're skipping periods for months at a time, that lining can be building up possibly, um, which may not be healthy for you. But if you're taking a hormonal contraception, which many of them keep that lining very thin and you're not having a period while you're on that, that is okay. It really is. And um, it actually can have some protective factors. <laughs> and this is not really necessarily uh, associated with your period, but we see this all the time. So it's very important your vagina does not want to smell like flowers or any like fruits or anything else. It has its own smell and it's fine. Like adding perfume products to make it smell like something it's not can make the problem worse. If you are using products because you have what you consider a foul odor, then you want to come in because if there's like a, especially like a fishy kind of smell that could indicate a bacterial infection, which, um, you know, sometimes our bodies can correct on its own, um, but sometimes need some antibiotics to take care of it. And, you know, those can cause uh, further infection and PID. So if you have a foul odor, then come in and get checked. Um, these products that they make 
make the problem worse. Um, the vaginal environment is acidic normally, and our pH can be become more alkaline for a million different reasons, stress, um, sex, you know, semen is alkaline. Uh, and then these products, all these products you put there can also make the vaginal environment more alkaline. So that just perpetuates that problem, um, which is really smart, right? Because they make more money if you keep buying their products. So it <laughs> makes it temporarily maybe smell like flowers. And then in a few days, it's going to be back to back to where it was. Um, no, your tampons or anything else really that you put up there is not going to get lost uh, indefinitely. We'll be able to find it. So if you think you lost something in there, let us know. Um, and then menstrual blood isn't inherently smelly, meaning, you know, it shouldn't, again, you should never have a foul odor. Um, it does smell different for sure than just normal discharge, but um, it should never have a really foul odor to it. Um, so if it does come in. Um, and then what you put in your body affects everything, including your menstrual cycle. So we're talking about drugs, alcohol, you know, diet, um, you know, do the best you can, right? Um, we'll talk here in a minute about social determinants of health. And it's, um, it's tough to just tell people, oh, have a bit healthy lifestyle, because that's not always possible for everybody. But just know that it does affect, you know, um, what we put in our bodies does affect everything. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to add quickly that I, I like to tell people and patients, I heard this when I was in another event, that your period is really like a report card for your body. Um, and so a lot of people, as has been mentioned, when they're stressed, they might notice that their cycles become different or when they lose an excessive amount of weight or start working out really hard after not doing any of that, they find that their periods either go away, that idea of amenorrhea or, um, you know, the, the skipping of periods, things might change. And so that's why keeping track of your periods and encouraging your, your friends, your partners, you know, with, again, we're destigmatizing these conversations. So having open conversations about people's periods and making sure people are keeping track of them is really important because it gives you an idea of, well, I know I was studying for step one and my entire life was, you know, upended. And so, okay, it kind of makes sense that I lost weight and then my period kind of got a little bit wonky it, rather than you really jumping and thinking, oh my gosh, you know, the end of the world is happening. You know, I, I'm hitting pre-menopause at the age of 24 or something, so. Thank you. Um, and then we're gonna talk now a little bit about menstrual inequities, um, specifically in our country. Um, the, these are here are just kind of, uh, just kind of facts that um, can contribute and we'll talk a little more in detail. Do, you, do I have? ability to look at my notes. Sorry, I have notes on this. So, okay. So um, the poverty accent, uh, aspect of it, so people who menstruate can expect to spend, and these are just some facts, uh, upwards of $1,000 over the course of a lifetime on menstrual products. Um, for many, this means resorting to degrading and unhygienic options. For example, a recent study demonstrated that two thirds of low income women in St. Louis could not afford um, menstrual products during, their previous, during the previous year, instead using cloth, rags, diapers, or paper as a subst substitute. State and local sales tax can further impede access, adding as much as 10% to the cost. This could put the price of a box of pads or tampons out of the reach of people struggling to make ends meet. Um, families on public assistance. Supplemental nutrition assistance programs and the Women, Infants, and Children program, or WIC, um, which is designed to provide nutritional support for children and pregnant or postpartum mothers, uh, cannot be used to purchase menstrual products. Um, under the laws governing these programs, individuals uh, who trade food stamps for tampons can be prosecuted. 
The WIC prohibition is especially harmful because many people need to access need access to external menstrual products for several weeks after birth um, due to bleeding and other postpartum discharge. Um, lack of access in public schools. So uh, students who cannot afford menstrual products may miss school or be less productive or engaged in the classroom. Children may suffer lifelong consequences because they lack access to menstrual products. Even missing just a few days of school can lead to significant performance gaps that are exacerbated by poverty and racism. Absenteeism is also linked to social uh, disengagement, feelings of alienation, and adverse outcomes even into adulthood. And this touches again on just making the menstrual period something that we can all discuss openly, honestly, this is so important. I mean, it's just insane to think about, right? It, it's, <laughs> women have been having periods literally since the beginning of time. And we are still, it's still stigmatized. Like it's in, incredible. I really had meant to put a little like history of the menstrual period. It was fascinating what women had to do um, at certain times in history, you know, during their periods, like being, you know, shamed and put it, put in rooms and put in tents and just let bleed and um you know there's lots of different stories out there um but it's just insane to me to think about housing instability um we know that many people who are homeless struggle to afford menstrual products the situation exacerbated by limited access to clean water and soap even when homeless shelters offer menstrual products many are still left out for example, limitations on when residents can use showers and other facilities can leave people with no recourse if they suddenly get their period outside those hours. Additionally, transgender men are often turned away from shelters or are harassed and assaulted in them. And so they may not be able to access menstrual, uh, menstrual supplies, even if shelters carry them. Many people avoid uh, shelters altogether, whether as a side effects of serious mental health issues or the perception and in many cases the reality that homeless shelters are unsafe and unsanitary. And then lack of access in correctional facilities. Uh, in 2016 over 200,000 women and girls were incarcerated in state and federal prisons and jails. Few states require or ensure adequate access to menstrual products in correctional facilities, resulting in dire circumstances for many under their jurisdiction. In such institutions, an imbalance of power can create still more consequences as many facilities require prisoners to ask correctional officers for menstrual products. Officers may use incarcerated people's basic hygiene needs to coerce them for sexual favors or other favors to punish them for any reason. They may also use the threat of withholding necessary products to keep prisoners in line or to prevent uh, them from reporting abuse or other harmful conditions. Um, these are just some blurbs that I found that I thought were important. I mean, there's so there's so much relating to this topic that is um, incredible and um, just absolutely incredible. And so these are just a few of them that I thought were like stood out to me. Um, so like those, those experiencing homelessness report infection caused by using tampons and pads for longer than recommended, right? Or by improvising with items such as paper towels or newspapers. Um, until very recently, this issue has been given little consideration in US policies and laws. It's an omission that affects everybody, but it hits hardest on populations for whom access and agency is most compromised. Uh, tampons and pads are rarely designated as allowable budgetary expenses for publicly funded schools, shelters, or crisis and emergency centers. And we talked a little bit about the incarcerated individuals and how that balance of power is used to um, just cause a, you know, degrading and humanizing things. Um, there's been, you know, rape and uh, and using their menstrual products as uh, the bargaining, like bargaining tool. I mean, it's just, um, it's just crazy. 
Um, but yeah, it's true. So those who can afford, cannot afford period products are at risk of isolation, infection, missed days at school work. Just imagine, you know, somebody, 13 year old girl, you know, getting their period at school. It's so taboo to talk about. She's scared to talk to anybody about it. Maybe she kind of already feels isolated for certain reasons. Um, and then, and then she has a big stain, you know, on her, on her pants and, and it just breaks my heart. Right. Um, so this, you know, we talk about, oh, we need to talk about periods more. It's, it's very important, right? This, it's not, it's, it's essential. Um, and so I think we all have, um, a little bit of a part in this and kind of spreading the word and, um, getting this information out there and just, um, and just making, making these changes. Oh yeah, oh yeah. In some states, pixie sticks, lip balm, and tattoos are tax-free. In 30 states, tampons and pads are not. I mean, I just don't understand how something that is, I mean, it's obvious we, it's something that we have to deal with all the time. And so that those, it's just basic hygiene should be, should be available to everybody. And this was just a good, um, a quote that I liked from, um, Jennifer Weisswolf, who is the author of Periods Gone Public, um, which is in our kind of resource list at the end. And, uh, you know, I wanted to touch on this. I, I do this with great humility. Um, and this is a huge, you know, a huge problem um, that unfortunately we're just starting to talk about in public, in a public way. Um, the, the, the statements I have on the side here, just some facts that I wanted to address. Um, and the first two, I wanted to explain those. So uh, that black women are more likely to have uterine fibroids, but also statistically, they say that they're half as likely to be diagnosed with endometriosis than white women. But that's not because they don't have it as much as white women. Um, think about it, right? So endometriosis is a silent, it's kind of a silent disorder or disease. You don't, you don't see it unless you go in with surgery and like look, look at lesions, but it can cause, what it does do is cause often extremely painful periods, uh, pelvic pain in between periods. Um, and, uh, sometimes very, very heavy periods as well. Um, it can cause bladder dysfunction, bowel dysfunction, painful urination, painful defecation. It can cause all these things. And there isn't like a clear uh, visual thing, like a fibroid. So you can you do a pelvic ultrasound, right? And there's nothing there. And when somebody has endometriosis, they can't see anything. So what's happening, right? It's not that that black women have it less, it's that they're not listened to and not believed and their pain is not addressed. Um, and, and it's been in the literature over the years that this, this statistic, right, that, oh, it's a white woman disease. And so then, then you know, women look up those things, why well, that can't be, that can't be me then because it's, you know, black women don't get endometriosis. It's not, oh, it's just a, another thing. Um, black women are more likely to report very severe symptoms, um, but again, you know, obviously not listened to. Um, wait, they tend to wait longer before seeking care for their painful symptoms. Um, and, you know, that is for many reasons too, but often because I think that they don't get listened to, so why bother? They, um, are dismissed uh, at the doctor, you know, why would you want to go in after you're dismissed and be told that it's in your head or it's, you're just making it up or it's just, it's fine, it's normal. Why would you, you know, why would you do that? Um, and just in general, the, the uh, distrust in, in the healthcare system um, among Afri African-American community, which is completely uh, warranted. And, and this is, you know, again, this is just touching on the surface. Um, and this kind of touches on so women and people of color receive less medical intervention for pain management. Again, uh, it just doesn't happen. They just don't get the treatment that they need, uh, aren't listened to. 
um, and they have a women of color have much higher mortality rates uh, during and after pregnancy. These are just again some things that I wanted to 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 bring up. Um, so what can we do about it? Um, we need to fight for accountability. So you know get to know your local uh, laws, uh, vote, um, you know, be um, uh, outspoken about it, talk about it, um, just, you know, fight for, for these types of things, um, do whatever you can, support the laws that advance menstrual equity. Um, and sometimes you have to search these things out, you know, but, but search it out, read books about it, listen to podcasts, you know, listen to things, just learn and seek out those things so that you can um, know how to help. Um, speak to local, speak to local homeless shelters, food banks, any organization that provide on the ground service to um, homeless, engage in public education to raise awareness and reduce stigma. Um, how can you advocate for yourself regarding health concerns related to menstruation? Um, what are the most important questions to ask? I mean, we kind of touched on this a little bit too, but um, just to kind of reiterate, you know, that these are the questions you should be asking and, and, the, and don't, uh, don't take no for an answer. You know, if, if, if you go in and you talk to your provider and they dismiss you or just say it's normal, um, you know, go see somebody else, they get a second opinion. Um, if you feel like this is not normal, you're having pain. Again, all the things that we talked about, seek out a second opinion if you have to, but advocate for yourself um, or ask help, you know, ask, ask for help. Um, Planned Parenthood is, I think, great. We often can't, you know, treat a lot of chronic conditions. We're just not really set up for that, but we can certainly refer you to places that can. Um, so. And then just some resources are, I mean, this is just uh, skimming the top, but just websites that are out there to learn about menstrual equity, um, some podcasts, I'm a podcast junkie. <laughs> There's so many good ones. If, you know, I'm sure if anybody has any suggestions, you know, put those up. And I mean, so many books, there's so many good books out there, but these are some of our favorites that we um, like. And again, you, gotta, you just got to seek out that, that knowledge and learn as much as you can, and especially if this is something you're um, passionate about. And there's a lot of work to do. And I think that is all that we have. We appreciate your time and attention. Yeah, no, um, and feel free to ask. I know we went long, sorry guys. I'm yeah. watching the clock as we're going long. Yeah. Um, obviously we're passionate about it and we could talk for days. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is really just scratching the surface and it's really just empowering you to know and to advocate and speak on and help others for yourself, for others, anyone to say, you know, what's normal, what's not normal? How do I advocate for it myself? Where can I go? How do we start raising awareness? Let's have this conversation. Um, and I, I know for us, a lot of times when we talk about raising awareness in conversation, we're like, okay, what can we do now? Like, what's next? How can I fix this? And so really just empowering, you know, is what we wanted to do. Just given a brief overview, let's advocate. How do you advocate? Um, and let's talk about it. So we appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Are we taking questions? <laughs> Ever jump in, Dr. Ravel, um, questions, yeah, no, anything you, so you want to add? Yeah, well, I don't know. I was actually going to have Brom if he could share a screen and play the clip I had sent him, um, which will actually supplement everything that you just said. And I was trying to put some things in the chat, but I, I kind of wanted to just briefly talk about um, now that we know like what periods are all about, I think that we don't always have a good sense of why period equity is such an important issue. And I think for me, the way I like to think you know, at least frame it is that it's not just about reproductive or sexual health. It's honestly this big button issue that is um, all about gender equality. Um, so I actually, what, Brown, why don't we play the video um, and then we can kind of, we'll use, I know we're a little bit over the time that's allotted, but we'll use just maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes to um, kind of 
take everything that was discussed in the lecture um, and the video and kind of frame it with regards to period equity. That sounds great. Let me know, let me make sure that everybody can hear this. That's the one. I think the hardest thing about being on the streets is probably being a female. If you're a woman, you like your face clean. You know, you like feeling good, smelling good. Yeah, period times are not good times for us. Hi, how are you? It is very difficult to have your period and very uncomfortable. And every day I wake up and I do my daily routine because nobody wants to smell, you know? And that's, that's kind of a big deal out here. I've been doing this for so long. I'm 27 years old. This will be my eighth winter out here straight. We had a pretty rough childhood growing up. My mom was a victim of domestic violence. And so she put us through a lot. I went into the system. She got custody of me again. And basically she was like, you know what? I don't want you in the system anymore, but you can't be here. I hadn't lived at home since I was, you know, 10 years old. You know, and I took care of myself. There was no keeping me home anyway, you know, whether she, if she wanted to or not. There's so many kids that it's like, they fall through the cracks, I guess. And that's kind of what happened with me. If you got cramps, <laughs> good luck, I don't know. Maybe you get a, a, a water bottle and some hot water from Starbucks or something, you know, you can do that. Um, maybe some, steal some Motrin. It's a little stressful, you know, it pops up, it's, you're running around trying to get what you need. Every month they are placed in a crisis situation. You shouldn't have to decide between a pad and having lunch. A big box of tampons probably runs around $10, so that could be half of what we make during the day. I'll just go get a, a tampons that I need. And then it'll leave me with nothing, because then I have then I can't eat. Tampons and pads are so expensive here. I mean, like, the cheapest box of tampons in this Walgreens right here is, like, a little over $7. It's more money than me and my boyfriend spend on a meal together. I would rather be clean than, you know, be full. This is not a poor issue. This is not just about getting products to those who need them, which is obviously a priority. This is really about bringing dignity to women. Um, I, I tend to flock to places like this, which is like public parks, um, where they have public bathrooms. I come here to Thompson Square Park and um, I do my, my cleaning up in the, in the sink. I get a big cup, like like the big McDonald's cup, and um, I fill it up with water. I'll, I'll actually, like, I'll straddle it this way. You're able to, you know, pour water and, you, you know, use the soap and, um, and basically wash over the toilet and get a really good cleansing at the same time. That's the best way to actually get, you know, your feminine hygiene um, accomplished. There's little, like, little tricks that I've picked up along the way. If it's only a few minutes, like a couple of minutes, I've always just used like paper towels or toilet paper or something like that. It was like a napkin from, from a, a restaurant, you know, those like big white napkins. I've used toilet paper and plastic bags. I've used towels. Cotton balls work, makeup pads. I've used socks. I had to ball up the sock and put it there. I had an old tank top that was bleached and I stripped it. I had to go rinse it out, squeeze it out, dry it, put it back. Went like four I, times that day. Sometimes if we didn't get things right away, we would just sit still, <laughs> you know, just sit still until we came up with something. And I've learned how to make my own tampons out of pads. So you take the pads. I try to use tampons as much as I can, but tampons are expensive.
And of course, ladies, you want to wash your hands first. <laughs> People tend to, when they do give care packages, it's usually pads. And then you tie them like this. And, but usually they're a little longer and then you can tie a knot here and then you can still have like the string. Basically, that's it. It produces infections, especially in some cases when women are wearing tampons for longer than they should, toxic shock syndrome. It is a health issue. Unfortunately, there really wasn't a clear policy on where women can access the products. There's different levels of homelessness. There's women in shelters. There's women in subways. There's women, you know, sleeping in parks. I used to be in a shelter, but I haven't been in one in a while because I don't drink and I don't do drugs anymore. And that's where most of the kind of crowd is, in a shelter. I feel safer out on the streets than I would in a shelter. Won't do it, I can't do it. I choose to be out here on the streets. So why we needed to legislate this, as opposed to just changing a policy here or there, is that it is not the law of the land. You want to feel clean like everybody else, you know what I mean? I like being out here. But everybody has a story. See, you never, you don't really know people. And everybody has a reason for the things that they do. They do, you know? So that's kind of my story. <laughs> so, yeah. So I don't know how many of you have seen that video. I know everyone's um, screen is off right now. So I guess just give me a reaction if you have or write something in the chat, but um, definitely an eye-opening clip. Um, whether you've seen it, I've seen it multiple times um, or whether you're seeing it for the first time, it's definitely powerful. And I think it brings home everything that was just discussed in, in the lecture, right? You know, we're remembering the amount of times someone has a period in their lifetime, um, around the mark of 450 times um, a year for those, uh, not a year, but in their lifetime of a reproductive person. Um, and then that's compounded when we have people who are in these quote unquote tight positions. So the video obviously is focused on people who are living through and um, enduring homelessness or living on the street. Streets. But I want us to kind of think about how COVID-19 not only exacerbated that issue, so not only do we have more people um, going out and finding issues with their job or employment, but if you guys remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, there was this huge rush for toilet paper. And toilet paper was nowhere to be found. I remember I was like on rotation. I just didn't understand what's going on because I was like, what's going I wasn't watching the news that much, sorry. I was on a very busy rotation that time. But it's like you go to the store and I remember there was like one thing of pasta left and that was it. If you remember the early days of the pandemic. And the same was said with period products. People were hoarding, those who could afford them, were hoarding pads, tampons, panty liners and they were harder to find. So you think about the people who were already having difficulty with access to period equity, they had challenges. And then you have the fact that many of the spaces that were created or that were public, that people who are um, marginalized and unfortunately vulnerable in our, in our population, those places were now closed. So places where people could frequent. Um, public housing centers were getting more limited in the way that they were open. Um, community centers were definitely closed, especially early in the pandemic. Some are still closed up till now. Um, you know, she used a lot of the public parks. And I, thankfully, public parks and public spaces have remained open throughout the pandemic, which is why there's been a huge rush to go camping and all that throughout. But you can imagine that the spaces that were provided to give period products, to make those care packages, to, to give tampons and pads, they unfortunately were not able to do their work in the beginning of the pandemic the way that they had envisioned and the way that they had wanted. So not only are we dealing with a public health crisis on a global scale, right, the pandemic itself, but we're dealing with another exacerbation of a health equity issue that's been 
slowly increasing in the way that we discuss um, other health disparities, which happens to be the the period poverty or the period tax that was mentioned in the lecture previously, and that many of you are here today because you have an interest or passion for. Um, you know, I, I think that if I can recall these numbers off the top of my head appropriately, um, like it's like two thirds or like 66% of people who are low income um, have difficulty finding affordable period products. Um, and, you know, there is in addition this tax on period products, as you just learned, and I kind of um, reemphasize in the in the chat, 30 states have uh, extra cost um, when it comes to picking up a pad, a tampon from the store. Um, whereas chapstick, Viagra, other things like that are considered uh, well-to-do health products. And I don't know, again, how many of you are familiar with that. I, I hope some of you didn't learn that for the first time with um, the lecture that doc, um, Dr. Tenenfass gave just a moment ago. Um, but you kind of think about all of that and really hope that with more attention on health disparities in our society, especially in this past year, there'll be a newfound interest in putting funding um, towards, if not funding legislation and policy towards making period access more equitable. I know that with the state of Washington, we, we, we all love our state. Um, I think all of us are from Washington, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there was recently um, the, uh, the ability to put pads and tampons and other period items for free in schools and other places of education, as well as an opportunity for there to be no tampon tax. And no, you know, tampon tax is just fun because it's the alliteration, but no tax on menstrual health items, um, which is huge, but we still have 30 other states to go. And the question often is, why is that even an issue? Why was this made in the first place? Like, why is there a tax on these items and, uh, you know, uh, Oh, we have an East Coaster. Okay, <laughs> why, why, why was that even put in place? Um, you know, New York. If you're on the East Coast, I don't know what state you're at, but New York is at least doesn't have a tampon tax either. But I, one of the big arguments is that people just didn't know, and so that's why I appreciate the group here today. At least a little bit earlier on, a couple of people probably hopped off at the at the thirty hour mark, um, or thirty after. But there was a lot of men here or people who I presume um, are um, identify as men um, in addition to women. And I think that we need to have these conversations cross gender throughout both for um, everybody, but also to stand in solidarity with people who are LGBTQ who also have difficulty and challenges um, getting menstrual equity um, and um, period care. But because the reason why there's a tax on these things or a huge reason is because the people that were making decisions at the beginning just didn't think about it, right? If you have a bunch of men who aren't going through those cycles that we just talked about, they're, they're not considering the fact that you are spending, as that video I just showed a moment ago, up to a hundred dollars a year. And I mean, that's that feels really generous in my opinion, <laughs> but you know, you're spending a lot of money a year plus some in order to have this ability to stay healthy. Um, and for many people have a sense of um, cleanliness, but uh, cleanliness in a way that you want to take care of what's going on with your body. Um, and so that's why kind of going back to what I said right before the video clip, I really think that um, menstrual hygiene, menstrual health care is not just about you know, making sure that we have more education, but it's about equity with regards to um, education, like who is getting educated, meaning who is staying in school and not leaving because they're embarrassed, who is having access to good and proper health care, who um, is able to really have representation in politics, right? Um, who is able to just be seen um, and seen in a way that they feel comfortable. And so, I, you know, with, I know it's a way over the time, but that's kind of what I wanted to leave you all with, just some food for thought um, and also a plug to continue to advocate. Advocating doesn't always mean putting money towards things. There's a lot of organizations doing period equity work 
tons of organizations. I mean, the Red Sea Collective is just one of them, um, but there's many organizations that are really trying to, now that we've understood COVID, um, reach across the way and provide items of um, menstrual hygiene to folks. And so I really encourage you to um, put, you know, donate time to them, um, if not money um, or to just read up on what period health is all about. There's a lot of great studies out there um, and also just continue to have groups like this where you're destigmatizing periods and menstrual health um, for all. So I think I'll kind of leave it at that and we can always have uh, a little bit of a discussion. I'm going to, I'm just checking out this chat right now, but um, if there's any questions, uh, I guess let me know. Thank you so much, Rachel. Really, that um, so much uh, poignant uh, comments there. So, um, thank you again. And I also wanted to thank our uh, earlier speakers, Nicole um, and Dr. Tenafos. I know that um, you've had a long uh, clinic day as well. So, I, I so appreciate that you have uh, taken the time to, to speak with us this evening. Um, yeah, as, as Rachel said, just if there's any questions at this point, um, I, I think now's the time to ask them. And and uh, just again, a, a round of applause uh, silently over Zoom as, as we've gotten used to over the last 15 months for, for all of the, the, the work that went into putting this presentation together today. So thank, thank you. Yeah, you know, I see a question about recommending any Seattle-based organization doing period equity work. And I know, Brom, you probably could speak to this, but the, the Red Sea Collective, from my understanding, you guys are based in Seattle or based in the Seattle land area, are doing some incredible things with regards to advocacy. I'm not too sure about um, other organizations off the top of my head, and so you might have to reach out to your peers for that. Um, but definitely um, the period um, movement as an organization is an incredible resource. Um, they have done such great work with continuing to educate. There's also the organization Period Equity, which was actually founded by, oh gosh, I do not remember her name, but uh, she is a lawyer who took New York City or New York State to court and was able to um, say that the tax on menstrual items was, um, uh, it was illegal essentially. And so that's why they took it away um, and then um, took that tax away because it was, um, uh, I'm having a brain fart. It, it was it was wrong in legal terms. I forgot the word, sorry. Um, and then there's also the organization, the PAD Project, which many of you might be familiar with. Um, the PAD Project is, um, they had produced um, period end of a sentence, a film that won an Academy Award, if many of you have seen that. Um, and that is a little bit more on a global scale about access um, and how basically period inequities really changes and impacts a, the way a girl can even go to school, right? Um, and so it's a big reason why there's this um, sense of um, an, a, an a imbalance with who you're seeing in leadership, who you're seeing in um, making the decisions for small towns, communities, villages, et cetera. Um, so those are three, I think, big national organizations, but there are so many more, so many. That's just the tip of the iceberg. I support the girls is awesome, um, by the way, too, another organization. Um, Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think we will uh, end the session just to be cognizant of people's evenings, but it has been so wonderful to hear from you all. And um, as Aggie is putting in the chat, uh, yes, our next session is tomorrow at noon, um, looking at uh, looking a little bit more closely at period equity, inequity. So that will be um, uh, promoted on the Red Sea Instagram handle. Um, and you should be able to find all the information you need to be able to log on to that session as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. It was, it was wonderful speaking to you all. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.